So which abstractions does Unix provide for devices now? So in Unix, peripheral devices are realized as so-called special files. So that's what the user program sees. These are uh, entries in your file system that look like files. So they have a name, they have access permissions and uh, modification dates and so on. But in fact, they don't store any data on a disk or, or somewhere else. But whenever they are accessed, they have a special bit indicating that they are this special device file. And whenever they're accessed using a system call, the kernel checks and sees that instead of reading or writing something to a file, uh, this data that is read or written has to come to or from uh, one of the device drivers in our system. So opening a special device file creates a connection from your user process to this respective device. And this connection is provided by the code of your device driver, which means you have direct access to the driver as a user mode process. And uh, for this, you have two sorts of special files. You have so-called block oriented special files or block devices, which include disk drives, tape drives, floppy disks, CD-ROMs, and so on. So everything that reads data in larger chunks of, for example, 512 bytes. And we've also seen our character oriented special files or just character devices, which include serial interface lines, printers, but also audio channels for a sound card and so on. And devices are identified by a tuple. So essentially what happens inside of the kernel is that there's a table which assigns a set of numbers to each device and you have a separate table very often for character devices and another one for block devices. So the first element of your tuple is just a bit indicating the device type. So it's either a block device, so you look up the functionality in the block device table, or it's a character device, so the kernel would look up the required information in the character device table. And now each controller in your system has two numbers here, which are called device numbers. So first you have a major device number and the major device number selects one specific device driver. For example, a device driver for a disk controller. And now you might have a disk controller with more than one disk attached to. So you need to be able to differentiate between the specific disk you want to talk to. So do you want to talk to the first, second or third disk? And this is encoded in the second part here, the so-called minor device number. So a minor device number always indicates a subdivision of the device indicated by the major device number. And this minor device number then serves to select one of the multiple devices controlled by the device driver. And this device driver is the one identified by the major device number here. So what do these special device files look like in the file system? Here I've shown you a partial listing of the dev devices directory that by convention holds the special files. You can also store special files somewhere else, but it's very convenient to have them in the dev directory directly in the root of your file system. And that's what Unix has used for like almost 50 years now. So this almost looks like a regular file listing. So for each file, you have these nine bits of access permissions indicating the access rights for the owner of the file, for the group of the owner and for all others. So R is read, write is uh, w is write, and uh, the third bit would indicate executable. Executable device files are pretty uncommon. So that's why uh, usually device files only have read and write bits. And then the first bit here indicates if it's a block device. So it's a B or it's a character device. Or you can also have so-called symbolic links, which are just other names for devices, which you could also create for regular files. So if you look at a regular file listing with ls, you would have seen a dash in front of here, which would indicate a regular file, or a d, which would indicate a directory. So b and c are just additional types of files, but these are handled specially inside of the kernel. Then each device can have an owner and a group, and it has a modification date here. And then, of course, it has a name. For example, def hda would be the first hard disk, hard disk A. Def hdb would be the second hard disk. And then we have different hard disks, SCSI hard disk, SDA. And then you have a partition on that SCSI hard disk, which is called SDA1. Here you have a serial interface, TTYS0. And you see the first four were block devices, so they were all disks. And the remaining three are character devices, so a serial interface, a printer, and a very special virtual device called DevNull. This is a device that is actually something like a trash can. So you can write everything into it and it's just discarded. 
So this can be very useful when you want to get rid of output, for example, on your shell. And as you see, in the middle here, we don't have a file size indicated, but we have uh, two numbers separated by commas, and these two numbers are exactly the major and minor device number. So we see for our two IDE hard disks, HDA and HDB, they are connected to the same controller, so they have the same major device ID, but they have a different minor device ID. So HDA has a minor device ID of 0, HDB a minor device ID of 64. The same for our SCSI disk, so SDA would be the whole disk here. So it's a different controller with major number 8, a minor number 0, and the first partition can be accessed separately, even though it's part of that hard disk here, and this gets the minor number 1. If we had a second uh, disk SDB, a second SCSI disk, this would have gotten the major minor number 64, and the first partition on that disk would then have been 65. So then we have our serial driver, which has a major device number of 4 and a minor device number of 64 here. Our printer has 6 and 0, and Defnal also has a major and minor device number of 1 and 3, respectively. So these not only look like regular file entries in your file system, but you can also access them using read, write, open, close, as if they were regular files. Of course, for character devices, you cannot just position back to the beginning of that character special file, because there is no memory of past devices sent over that channel. Uh, whereas for these uh, block devices, you can actually position, so you can say, please read 1000 bytes from offset 3,500,000 or something like this. So these are the Unix primitives to access files in general and uh, yeah, device files uh, in special. So uh, this is just a quick overview and details as always are in the main pages. So we have an open function. An open function is passed the name of, for example, our device here, so def uh, ttys0, for example, and we also pass a number of flags, for example, indicating if we only want to read to this uh, file or if we also want to write to this file. And when this open was successful, so that when you call the system call open, your operating system checks if this file exists first, and then if you are uh, allowed to have access to this device, and if all of this is the case, then the operating system uh, yeah, de defines a new file descriptor. A file descriptor is just an integer number, so it takes an unused number from the set of file descriptors for your process, and then allocates it to this device that was opened here and returns this integer number, so this file descriptor number, to the user process. So all subsequent accesses to this file happen using the file descriptor. So instead of passing a file name every time, you then just pass the descriptor to that file until you close that file again because you stopped using it. So when you want to position your read-write pointer, you can do this inside of a file, and also on a block device like a disk, you use lseek, so seek just goes to a certain position, and this L stands for long. Uh, this has uh, historical reasons, because originally this call was just called seek, but it only had a 16-bit offset parameter, which meant you couldn't really seek very far, so lseek now takes a long parameter for seeking. So uh, you pass this pile descriptor that was returned by open, you tell uh, the offset you want to seek to, and this offset can be either relative to the start of the file, or it can be relative to your current position, for example, and this information is passed by the third parameter called whence, and it actually returns the position it was able to seek to. For example, if you try to seek beyond the end of the disk, it might return an error. Then you can read data from your device, so again you pass your device dri uh, driver ID here, so you do uh, your file uh, ID, uh, then you pass a pointer to a buffer to uh, where actually the data that is read from the device is stored, and then you pass the number of bytes to transfer. So uh, when read succeeds and returns, it actually indicates how many bytes it was able to read, and all of the bytes it has read are stored in this buffer from the zeroth byte of that buffer here. So of course you need to take care that the size of that buffer you allocate in your user process is large enough to store the amount of bytes you want to read. Write works very similar, just the other way around. So here you again pass your file descriptor ID, then pass a pointer to a buffer and a count, but this time the operating system reads data from your buffer, 
that you want to write to your device and then writes it to this file or device. And finally, when you don't want to use a file any longer, use the close system call. So you pass the file descriptor that you want to close. And then after that, this file descriptor is invalidated. So you don't have access to that file anymore until you open it again, obviously. So using these file descriptors has two reasons. For the, uh, on the one hand side, the kernel doesn't have to parse and check for this device name every time you do an operation on a file. So when you open it, your, uh, the kernel has actually confirmed it's there. So when you just pass a file descriptor, the kernel can then uh, leave out these checks. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it allows you to access multiple files. So you can, of course, open a number of different files at the same time, which each get their own file descriptor. And we've already seen that we have special file descriptors usually allocated to three special functions, 0, 1, and 2, stand for the standard input, standard output, and standard error channels of a Unix process. So these are obviously character devices because they are usually connected to your terminal or terminal emulation on your screen. Now you may wonder if you uh, take a look at the functionality of a device driver, how to initiate additional functions. So for example, how do you tell a disk controller uh, to perform a self check of the disk if it's uh, actually running correctly or how to uh, format, uh, format a disk or a floppy disk. And this does not happen using the regular read-write channels. So data you read and write uh, from and to a device is directly passed to the device and this is usually unchanged, except for some exceptions for terminals. So if you want to execute some special functionality, there has to be an additional communication channel to the device, which is not available for regular files. And this is realized by a special I, uh, system call called IO control. So IO control is a system call to control special functionality of a device. So to use this, you again pass a file descriptor here, and then you pass an integer describing a request, and then you can pass additional parameters. So this is a system call having an arbitrary number of parameters here. And this additional parameters are just parameters further specifying the request you sent. Now, of course, whatever you send there is very specific to the device. So you could, for example, try to format a disk drive, but it would be very silly to try to format a printer. So each device has its own I.O. controls. These are usually specified in the main page for the specific device drivers. So there are also main pages for device drivers, of course. And if you look at the further down at the main page for I.O. control, conforming to no single standard. So each developer of uh, a single device driver decides uh, for his or her own uh, which of the I.O. control functionality is needed, which requests map to which functionality, and which data is read. So arguments, return values, semantics of I.O. control vary according to the device driver in question. And this I.O. control call was used as something like a catch-all to actually have a standard way for this, yeah, well, side channel information to control a device instead of passing data from or to a device. So there might be some situations where in your user program you want to wait for data from multiple devices. So for example, let's assume you're writing a networked game and uh, this means you would have to wait for maybe data coming in over the network, indicating moves of your fellow players on other computers. And you also have to wait for data coming from your joystick or your joypad or whatever, uh, indicating that the user has initiated an action like to, to move your uh, player uh, figure on the screen or to shoot or whatever. So, so far we have just encountered read and write calls which are blocking. And if we do a read on one file descriptor and it blocks, we cannot continue executing because we're in blocked state, obviously. So if we started to do a read from our network card, waiting for a network packet coming in, we could not at the same time start a read from our joystick to figure out if we need to take some action on the screen. So this is, of course, unfortunate. And the question is, what can you do about this if we really need to read from several sources like devices or files at the same time? Now, one alternative, which we didn't mention here, is you could use multi-threading, obviously, or even uh, fork, a, fork a child process to do something like this and do communication. But there are easier ways to do this. 
The first way is to do non-blocking I.O. So when you open uh, such a device, for example, uh, like a device for, for a keyboard here, you can pass a special flag uh, in addition to flags indicating that you want to read or write. And this flag is called O underline and delay. And this stands for open with no delay. And uh, this means that whenever you try to read a character from uh, this file descriptor that uh, corresponds to a character device, for example, then if no data is available, then it just, just returns immediately with the information uh, zero, there is no data available. So what you have to do again is you have to pull this device, wasting compute time, of course, as we've seen repeatedly using the read operation until you have received some data. And then you can pull the next device. So you can first start pulling your joystick, then you can start pulling your network card and so on. Obviously, this is a suboptimal solution and this just wastes CPU time. So there has to be a better way to do this. And this better way for waiting for multiple devices is to introduce a blocking wait where you don't only wait for one file descriptor, but you can tell the system to wait for multiple file descriptors at the same time and return as soon there was action on one of these file descriptors you were waiting for. So this system call is a bit more complex. It's called select. So the name already says what it's doing. It allows you to select between different devices you want to wait for. And for this, you actually pass first a parameter indicating how many file descriptors you want to wait for. So this is actually the maximum number of the file descriptor, which select should consider. And then you pass pointers to structures uh, called FD sets. So these are described in detail in the man page here. And you can wait for uh, specifically file descriptors that would respond to a read operation, file descriptors that would respond to a write operation, and file descriptors that would respond to a special error condition here. And finally, you can specify a timeout. So if nothing has happened for, for example, a second or so, you could still terminate that select call and do something else and then wait for input later on. So these file descriptors read, write, and error uh, indicate the file descriptors to wait on. And the timeout then tells our select, even if nothing has happened in that time we've been waiting, still return and indicate nothing has happened. Now setting these file descriptors here by hand is a bit tedious. So if you look at the select man page, you find that there are C preprocessor macros provided to help you creating these descriptor sets. And uh, the result of your select call is actually that the descriptor sets here that you passed are modified. And these only contain those descriptors which resulted in the deep blocking of the call. So for example, if only one file descriptor uh, would uh, essentially uh, have caused the return from select, so only one thing was happening, it was a read file descriptor, then you would have the information in that FD set structure here. And if there were multiple, you would have several read descriptors, write descriptors, and so on. And so then you can iterate through all of them and handle whatever is required to handle uh, data that has come in. So as you see, we're looking for ways to make I.O. operations more efficient because I.O. devices are so much slower than your CPU and your main memory. And one of the approaches to make I.O. operations faster is to provide buffering for I.O. operations. So what would happen if you had an I.O. device that would not have any buffering capability inside of your operating system kernel? Now, let's assume uh, that data arrives from an I.O. device, and this is directly passed to the user process, but this user process has not executed the corresponding read operation already. So for example, you press a keyboard key without the uh, receiving process actually running a read operation. So if there is no buffer here, there is no place to store it because read wasn't executed, so you don't have a buffer which is passed by read to the operating system to call, store data into. So the only thing you can do is to throw away this data because there's no place to store it. Uh, so data would get lost or discarded. So for example, you would press some keys, but if your read operation isn't running, these key presses would be lost and you'd have to wait until your program executes read uh, to enter some keyboard input. That's obviously pretty inconvenient. On the other hand, if you try to write something and an output device is busy, then write would either fail or it would block the process until the device is ready again. This takes some time, so you want to avoid this. 
and it finally results in a problem. So even if you have a read or write operation without buffers, it means the address space, so the buffer inside of your user process that you passed using the read or write operation would have to be a main memory. So this would mean a process executing an IO operation cannot be swapped because you need to keep this buffer in memory, which is very inconvenient because these are exactly these candidates that you want to swap because they may uh, take a long time before they're uh, just being able to run again because they have to wait for that IO operation to complete. So there must be a better way again. So of course a better way is to introduce buffers here and let's first assume we just have a single IO buffer inside of the operating system that actually uh, creates a split between the connection from the IO device to the OS and finally the moving of data from the OS to the user process. So when you have a single I.O. buffer for read, it means that whenever an I.O. device sends data here, the operating system device driver for that device can already accept data and write it into its internal buffer. And as soon as our user process then execute a read operation, then the operating system just delivers this data from its internal buffer to the user process. Uh, for block devices, this even means that we can do more optimizations, for example, uh, while we have this block in memory and it hasn't been read already by a read call, we can still request the next block from our I.O. device so we can do some prefetching. Uh, so our uh, process reading multiple blocks from disk doesn't have to wait for that long. And this means the process can now be swapped uh, because uh, the DMA, for example, for a device can write to this kernel buffer instead of having to write to a user process buffer. On the other hand, for write, uh, data is copied to this internal buffer and as soon as this copy operation is completed our user process can continue, the caller does not have to block and data buffers in this user address space could then immediately be reused which also makes our IO processing a bit faster. So what improvement can we get from introducing a single IO buffer? Let's try to estimate the performance by doing some simple back of the envelope calculation. So let's assume we have several parameters here. So we have a parameter t indicating the duration of a read operation. Uh, then we have a parameter c, which is the compute time required for processing that data. We have a parameter m, which is the duration of the copy process from a system buffer to a user process buffer. And finally, we have a parameter b, which indicates the overall time required for reading and processing a block of data. Now, without a buffer, uh, the time required for reading and processing a block is that we have to execute the read operation plus the processing operation and then we have finally transferred our data immediately back to the user address space. Now if a buffer is involved, a single buffer here, we have another timing here. So this timing consists of the maximum time of the read operation and the compute time because these can now operate in parallel because we have a buffer to store data into plus the time that is required for copying our buffer from the kernel back to the user space. So if the duration of a read operation is about uh, approximately the same as the compute time required for processing and the copy operation time is zero, then uh, the time without buffering would be about the double the time required when uh, using a single buffer. Of course, this is just a very rough assumption because unfortunately usually the copy time is much larger than zero. So this is not quite the speed up you can get by introducing a single buffer. So usually it's a speed up of less than a factor of two. So what else could you do? Well, instead of adding a single buffer, you could try to add two buffers. So this is called double buffering. So for read, this means while data is transferred from the IO device to one of the buffers here, then data contained already in the other buffer can be copied to the user address space simultaneously because we have two independent buffers now. And uh, for write, it means we uh, just do it the other way around. So while we're writing here from our user process address space to one buffer, the previously written buffer can at the same time be transferred to our IO device. So after each of the operations, we just switch both buffers around. So we switch from the lower to the upper here for this operation and at the same time for, to from the upper to the lower for the other operations. So this 
read operation with double buffering should be even more efficient. So let's do another quick calculation here. Uh, we know a double buffer enables to execute a read operation in parallel to a copy operation and to processing. So without buffer again we had b0 equals to t plus c with a single buffer. We had this maximum of tc plus m. And now with a double buffer we have the maximum of t, so our transfer time, and compute time plus, trans, uh, plus copy time here. And this of course can have quite a bit of improvement here. So especially if C plus M, so the time required for processing a data block, plus the trend required for transferring from the kernel to the user address space buffer, if this is less than the time required for doing the transfer to the device, then our device can be utilized to 100%. If this is not the case, we can still get some significant improvement out of double IO buffering. But we can even improve this further by introducing even more buffers. And we do this by using so-called ring buffers. So we extend the system of switching between one and the other buffers by just switching whenever a request comes through a list of buffers. And when we arrive at the end of the buffer, that's why they're called a ring buffer, we just start from the beginning and then we have to synchronize the uh, user process and the kernel driver in order not to override things that are not yet processed in our ring buffer here. So for reads, this means that multiple, so many, depending on the size of your ring buffer, data blocks can be buffered even if the reading process does not call read fast enough. And for write, me, this means that a writer can already execute multiple write calls uh, written in one buffer after the other without being blocked. And then the IO device would operate on them even one after the other in the same order. So ring buffers is what is commonly used for communicating between devices and user processes because it's efficient, it's relatively easy to implement if you get your pointers correct, obviously, and uh, it can improve the speed significantly. Sometimes also IO devices directly support ring buffers. For example, this is very common for network cards, which can implement ring buffers, for example, in their own network card memory, because they have a relatively high data throughput, which should not be dependent on the speed of reading or writing in your user process. So IO buffers can be used to decouple the actual IO operations to the device from the user processes. Uh, so essentially it decouples the operation of the device driver con uh, talking with the IO device and the device driver talking with user processes. And this enables us to handle an increased rates of IO requests, at least for a short duration, so until our buffers are full. And of course, when the buffers are full, we'll have to wait until they're emptied again. And this means in the long run, so if we have a device that's much faster than our process can actually process the data from that device, we would still have to block because we don't want to lose data. So we have to wait. So for example, the device have to wait until our process would be ready to receive data again. Uh, buffers are nice, but of course they also create overhead. We need to manage the buffer structure. They require space in main memory and they require time to do this additional copying. And in very complex systems, data could also be buffered multiple times within the kernel. And one very common example was in the TCP IP network stack, where you had several layers from the physical layer over the IP and TCP layer to the application layer. And in very early TCP IP stacks, a packet would be copied each time uh, you switch between these layers in your network stack. And this was very inefficient and you should avoid this as po if possible. And one of the very first BSD Unix systems actually introduced a data structure called MBUFFs that were a very specific data structure to speed up network packet processing without having to copy it over. And this increased network speeds over Ethernet, for example, significantly. But of course, it also complicated programming inside of the kernel, whereas outside of the kernel, nothing changed for user processes. So that's a nice thing about having uh, abstractions that are actually general enough to support such a change. So we've also noticed that a device driver has to consider the mechanical properties of IO devices. So let's look at one of the most common uh, mechanical devices in a computer, a disk drive. So a real hard disk drive, not an SSD. So uh, disk drivers usually can queue multiple requests. So they, uh, when they accept requests, they not only ac accept a single request, operate on this and then wait for the next one, but they accept a number of requests coming from 
maybe different processes, like two processes want to read from different files at the same time, so these can be interleaved for disk access. And depending on the order of executing the requests, you can increase the efficiency of these accesses significantly. And this is because the time required to process such a request consists of a number of parameters, which all take time. So first is the positioning time. So we've seen our disk contains uh, rotating platters of uh, magnetic material here. And uh, these platters are split into tracks here. So these tracks are just these concentric circles here. And each track is again split into multiple sectors. So this is just a piece of your pie here. So when your read write head is currently on the outside here and the block you want to read is on the inside, you have to, re uh, to move your read write heads all the way to the inside to read your block. And this and then you finally have to wait until the block you actually requested uh, arrives under your read write head due to the rotation of your disk. And finally, of course, you have to transfer this data back to the computer from your controller. So one optimization criterion we should look at is this positioning time, because this is a mechanical operation. Uh, because, so you need to start the heads slowly. You need to break them before they, so they arrive on the exact correct track. So this is a relatively slow operation. So you want to avoid uh, large movements of your head in your disk as much as possible. And you do this uh, using very similar approaches to uh, scheduling approaches we've seen in our CPU scheduling lecture. So essentially what you define for I.O. scheduling, as we call it, is just an order or a priority of requests. So we've seen several different CPU scheduling approaches for single processor system. So I.O. scheduling works very similar. So one very simple I.O. scheduling approach is FIFO. And FIFO, as we've already seen, means first in, first out. So the driver processes the requests in order of their arrival. And as for memory access, we also have a reference sequence here. And this reference sequence just gives us track numbers of the tracks containing the data we want to access. So we ignore this rotational delay here and only consider the seek time to move our head to the correct track. So our first request would try to access track number 98. The next one would try to access 183, then 37, and so on. And uh, when this request for track uh, 98 arrives, our, our read write head is currently located at track number 53. So when the first request arrives, we have to move our head from 53 to 98. Then the next one arrives, we have to move it to 183. Then we have to move it down to 37, then to 123, uh, 22, down to 14, up to 124 again, down to 65, and finally to 67. And now we can uh, add the total number of track changes required, so from here to here, from here to here, and so on. So all the tracks we had to move over, which is more or less linear to the time required for doing all these seek operations, and our result is 640. So FIFO for this reference sequence here uh, creates large movements of the disk arm, so we have a long average processing time here. So like with processor scheduling, we ask ourselves if there are ways to optimize this. And of course there are. And one way to try to optimize this is to prioritize requests. So we could try to prioritize the request that we currently received with the shortest processing time. So this is called shortest seek time first. So uh, this assumes the same reference sequence as before. And it also assumes that positioning time of our disk is proportional to our track distance. So when uh, we look at these, uh, at this algorithm here and our request, we would have such a sequence here for processing time, which reduces the amount of way that we have to move our disk head here. And this results in a significantly reduced number of track changes which is, if you sum it up, 263. And this is very similar to shortest job first scheduling. Uh, but this also means that shortest seek time first can also lead to starvation. So when more and more uh, requests come in that are close to your current head position here, then an outstanding request that's far away would be pushed further and further back. So if there's a steady stream of just close by requests coming in, then this uh, process, uh, the, this request that has a very large distance to cover, uh, then has to wait for a long time. And still, this is not yet an optimal approach for doing disk scheduling. So one scheduling approach that 
uh, or you could think what we take it from real life is called the elevator approach. And this works like an elevator in a large skyscraper. So essentially, uh, an elevator doesn't move up, down, up, down, depending on the request. So it tries to move in one direction until it has to turn around because there are no requests on uh, any levels of your building further up. So uh, that's the same thing we do with our disk hat here, our disk arm. So we move the disk arm in one direction until no more requests are available for this direction. And then we turn around and use the other direction here. And as this is very similar to what elevators do, this is called elevator scheduling. So we use the same reference sequence as before. And we assume that originally we had our head moving into the direction of uh, track zero here. And when we do this, we go down and down until we arrive at the lowest number. And then we go up again, up again, and up again. And if we count the number, total number of track changes here, we have an even lower number than with shortest seek time first, which is 208. So it's still a bit lower. And this means that new requests are executed without additioning positioning time because they just fit in between in our direction if they're on the way of our movement. This uh, is a, uh, an approach that uh, has no starvation problem, but long waiting times are possible if there are many, many small requests that go all the way, all the way up and your next request is somewhere down here. Nevertheless, this is the most optimal algorithm and this is actually what is used in many operating systems. So when we look at I.O. scheduling, we know that disks are intelligent devices, so we not only uh, read and write bits directly from the disk surface, they have a controller, they can uh, actually store outstanding requests and reschedule them, uh, which means that the physical properties of that device are hidden, so we only have logical block numbers, we don't have physical track and sector numbers anymore. So essentially, uh, the problem is that this optimization doesn't really work for us anymore because we don't have direct access to the set movements. So disks also have huge caches. So if we try to read a block again that we've just read a second ago, it is just delivered from the cache. And of course, solid state disks no longer contain any mechanical parts. So we don't have any seek problems there. So IO scheduling slowly uh, loses relevance here and the success of a given strategy is more difficult to predict because what we think is a physical property of the disk is no longer one. Nevertheless, the I.O. scheduling is still important because CPU speeds increase further and further, but disk speeds do not. Uh, and Linux currently, for example, implements two different variants of the elevator algorithm plus a FIFO algorithm for SSDs, so disks without positioning time. One of these uh, elevator algorithms is called Deadline, which prioritizes read requests with shorter deadlines. And there's a complete fair scheduler, which provides all processes with an identical fraction of the IO bandwidth. So what have we learned today? We've seen that IO hardware comes in many, very, very many different variants here. Sometimes it's difficult to program. And the art of designing an operating system consists of nevertheless trying to define uniform and simple interfaces using the hardware efficiently and maximizing the utilization of the CPU on the one hand and IO devices on the other hand. So uh, every device is different. So you need a device driver for every single device out there. So the availability of a large number of device drivers is extremely important for the success of an operating system because well, if you have a device that you already bought and you want to use a specific operating system and it doesn't have support for your Wi-Fi card or your printer, you don't want to use that operating system. And as a consequence, device drivers are by far the largest subsystem in Linux as well as in Windows. So uh, very many people doing kernel work actually do work on device drivers that can get a bit boring and frustrating, especially because documentation on devices is sometimes difficult to obtain or full of errors. Uh, so writing device drivers is not a lot of fun, but of course you have to do it in order to enable your computer to do IO. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening and until next time. Bye.